Warning, the Not Real Art Podcast is intended for creative audiences only. The Not Real Art Podcast celebrates creativity and creative culture worldwide. It contains material that is fresh, fun and inspiring and is not suitable for boring old art snobs. Now, let's get started and enjoy the show. Greetings and salutations, my creative brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Not Real Art Podcast, where we celebrate creative culture and the artists who make it. I'm your host, Erin Yoshi, and today we have Anthem Salgado. Anthem is an artist turned entrepreneur. He's the founder and lead business coach of Art of Hustle. For entrepreneurs and creatives wanting to grow their practice while still maintaining their integrity, their ethics, their soul, creativity, and well-being, Anthem provides sound guidance and strategy that's proven to untangle your to-do list and clear a pathway to a new forward movement. He's led trainings and provides strategy to solo entrepreneurs, small businesses, nonprofit organizations, helping people successfully change careers, launch their business, promote their work, and generate new revenues. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. Hello and welcome today on Not Real Art. We have the one and only anthem of Art of the Hustle. And, you know, we are so thankful to bring you onto the show today because honestly, Anthem, you know, I've known you for a long time. You are a dear friend. And I honestly don't know sometimes what I would do without your advice and wisdom along the way. So Anthem is actually my business coach as well as just a dear friend that I've gone to for advice. So, you know, Anthem, thank you so much for being with us today on Not Real Art. Thank you for having me, Erin. It's a pleasure. Can you take us back, you know, walk us through a little bit of your journey. You were a creative artist yourself earlier on, kind of when we first met around those days. What did you used to do as your creative practice? I identified as an inter- and multidisciplinary artist. I graduated from art school with a visual arts degree And even back then, I was pretty multidisciplinary. So I started out aspiring to be an illustrator, dabbled a little bit in photography, some video, conceptual art, installation art. And then after college, I found myself hanging out with a bunch of folks who were cultural workers and activists and also identified as poets. So that was my segue into poetry, literature, short story, fiction, etc. And after looking at my work over a period of time, I realized everything was written from the first person perspective, which really lent itself towards monologue. And then that became my segue into performance and theater, screen acting, stage acting, and to support that entire all of those different things, I'd always been involved in one way or another in arts administration. So house managing, program managing, communications, marketing, etc. Yeah, I mean, that speaks so much to me because I feel like, you know, it's like you have to do sometimes the back end to be able to do the creative practice. Like, you know, they go so much hand in hand. Positively. I feel like it's yeah. informed me in a big way, even the work that I do right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, so take me through your creative, you're doing your art, you're doing arts administration, kind of like what took you into the direction of becoming like a coach? To be 100% frank, it was the 2008 recession. You know, as a lot of artists know, we're primarily, a lot of us are gig workers, right? And I've lived that way for my entire professional history, jumping around from gig to gig, having one gig, having five gigs, having 10 gigs, like you just make it work. That's our superpower in life is just being creative, even with how we manage our profession. So when the recession happened, a lot of gigs just dried up and it was really difficult to find work. And I was feeling really frustrated and stuck. And I got to the point where I was just like, I'm just going to have to build something. If no one wants to hire you, hire yourself. That that was my philosophy at the time. So I jumped into marketing consulting and I knew that was an area that I was pretty comfortable, 
pursuing mostly because I'd already done it for organizations. And I also knew that there was a need there. There are a lot of artists who do great work who are underrepresented because they don't know how to advocate for their own work. They don't know how to communicate their value. And so I felt like this is going to be a good place for me to jump in and feel like I'm making a contribution to my field and at the same time get myself paid. So that was that was my introduction to marketing consulting. And then over time, I realized, guess what? It's not just artists that need this help. It's everybody. <laughs> so then I just started opening my doors and saying, you know what? If you need this help, I will help you. And it turned out a lot of uh, small business owners needed this help. People who identified as sole proprietors, small organizations, etc. So I just helped everybody. And when I decided to go ahead and open up those doors, my title changed to business coach. Um, before that, were you an artist coach? Is that what you're saying? It was, uh, it was marketing consulting, pretty mm -hmm. much, but with a with specialization in artists and nonprofits. So initially when you started, what were like some of the offerings that you would offer to artists? So in the very beginning, it was very workshop focused. I actually like to tell this story because it's fun to see how far it's gone. The very first workshop I gave, 100% experiment, had no idea what I was doing, was I wanted to teach folks how to do basic PR, right? So writing a media release do some lightweight event promotion, that type of thing. And eight people showed up, as I recall. I didn't have access to a space, but I was friends with some people at a theater. And they said, all of our rooms are booked, but except for the lobby. So we can give you the keys and you can let yourself in and you can use the lobby. <laughs> and uh, that's the best we could do. But I was like, you know what? This is the hustle. So I'm going to take it. Uh, yeah. I gave a workshop in a lobby around a utility table. Eight people showed up. I didn't even have a slide deck or anything. I didn't have any equipment. I had printouts and we just sat there and we grinded. We did analog work for like three hours and people paid to participate. And I was like, wow, this is fantastic. So that was the beginning of it, it was really workshop focused, teaching basic skills. And then over time, more and more people started asking like, hey, how does that principle work again? Or what, what was that thing? I wish I could hear it again. And then it clicked to me that people needed more specific advice and more one-to-one -one work. And that's when I started offering my services more as a coach, as well as a workshop facilitator. Yeah, because I, I feel like the coaching one-on-one -on -one is so helpful. I've seen it change my own trajectory. And what I really like is that you focus a lot of times on these kind of like low lift, high impact things that like I would never spot. Like I feel like sometimes as a creative, you're like in the weeds. You just like aren't paying attention to it. And a lot of times you've kind of uplifted those things for me. So when you're working with other artists, like how do you kind of, you know, like what do you look for? What are you spotting? How are you trying to guide them? A lot of times I'm, I approach the work, I think my superpower when working with folks is that I'm an outsider. Like the less I know about someone's work in a weird way, the better. Because then I could just look at their marketing and communications assets as an outsider and I could immediately ask myself some basic questions. Do I get it? Do I understand what's happening? Is this website navigable? I can just experience it with fresh eyes, whereas someone who's in the weeds can't see these things because they're so close to the work. But as an outsider, again, I have no biases at all. I just come in and the analysis comes off fresh. You know what I mean? Like, does it work or does it not work? Do I get it? Do I not get it? So we just really go from there, like me arriving as a stranger. So that's really, I, I feel like, where I could lend my expertise as, as an outsider. I mean, it's crazy because it sounds so simple, but it just makes so much sense to be like, do I get it? is this clear? You know, like, <laughs> right. do I know what you're trying to convey to me? Because a lot of times, you know, I know that I've done that in my own marketing where I'm like, I'm trying to put too many things on one flyer, or I'm trying to put too much out there all at once. And I like overwhelm people. And so just like having the fresh eyes, I could see being so helpful. So today, what are some of the offerings that you like to offer to artists? Well, I still like workshops. There's something really nice about getting folks in dialogue in a group setting. So I still like offering those from time to time. And I've been pretty fortunate to be able to give some recently through some cool organizations. Intersection for the Arts in the Bay Area still 
contacts me pretty regularly to facilitate workshops. And I've gotten a chance to give a workshop for Grants for the Arts, again, also pretty recently, as well as Arts Council of Santa Cruz and Theater Communications Group is another one that I worked with, I believe, over the summer. So I love giving workshops just because there's something really nice about putting people in a room, whether it's a physical space or a virtual room, and just having those ideas sort of bubble up and collide and see what comes forward. But otherwise, one-to-one coaching, as you had mentioned, I think is probably where I personally shine the most because it, I love that customized advice. I love getting into the work, you know, rolling up my sleeves and really partnering with somebody to make things happen. And I feel like one-to-one is positively where that that would help. Right. So when you're working with like someone new, or I guess because you've been working with such a variety of people over the years, what are common sticking points that you see people kind of getting stuck at? Yeah. So there are probably a bunch, but off the top of my head, I feel like the recurring one is people's obsession with tools, marketing tools specifically, and not really knowing how to use them. Mm. Right. So what I like to tell people, and you know, so this will happen a lot. Someone will hit me up through an email or some kind of, you know, request or inquiry and they'll say, can you help me with my social media? Can you help me with my Instagram? Can you help me start a podcast? Can you help me with my blog? Right. So these are all tools. And so what I like to tell people is those specific tools are kind of like vehicles. Imagine them as delivery vehicles. So an airplane, a box truck, a bike messenger, they're all there to deliver something. But the most important thing is the actual content that they're delivering. Totally. So everyone has to get back to basics, which is what is your story? What is your main message? Because that's how you maximize on each of those specific tools. If we're just grabbing tools, it's like sending out a fleet of delivery vehicles and when they arrive at their destination, they may deliver nothing, right? Because people haven't fully thought out, what is my story? What's my narrative? What value do I bring to the universe? So first and foremost, I say, let's flesh this out. Who are you? What are you all about? What are your qualifications? Why are you passionate about this work? If someone wants to work with you, what should they know about you? Once we flesh out all these details, then it's easier to populate all of those tools that I mentioned in the beginning. But if you just go straight to the tools without the actual content, then you might be wasting some really valuable resources, time being most valuable among them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think of, I think I came to you with one of those too, where I was like, Anthem, I want to grow my social media. (laughs) (laughs) And it was like, well, do you get a lot of clients through there? It was like, well, you know, how is this really benefiting you if it does and doesn't? And I think you helped me reframe my thinking around it because at the time I was like really trying to spend a lot of time on it when I realized, well, that's actually not where I, you know, I get some validation through there and some exposure, but it wasn't like the main avenue that I met and built with clients. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And and so I think that, you know, in this time of age, like there's so much focus on social media being the thing that, you know, oftentimes we spend so much more time on that than maybe other like avenues that also work for marketing and exposure. Yeah. Well, different tools work for different audience types and for different situations. But you know what always works? Having a good story. That's why I love starting there. The one thing that unites most of us as a species is language, the idea that we can communicate to one another. So we always, in my system anyways, always start with language. Always, 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 always start with language. Because once you have that story figured out, then you could do all kinds of amazing things with it as far as initiatives and campaigns and, you know, all kinds of things that you could try with marketing and communication. So yeah, story first. Yeah, absolutely. I always, I can't remember who had said this, but they were telling me basically like people don't buy the what you're doing, they buy why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And so like the more clear you are on your why, then the more that they can get invested into what you're doing, you know, and then they really follow along with it. So I think that that makes a lot of sense about really fleshing out your narrative, because I think a lot of times we think we know, you know, we're like, oh, well, we do this because of for whatever reason, you know, like I'm working on this project because of climate change or whatever. But you have like 
even though it's in your head, sometimes just by putting it down on paper, like you made me do that a lot, you know, like write it down, make a vision board. You made me listen to books and audio books and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Positively. Yeah. Yeah, I think that all those were incredibly helpful. So you have this quite robust library of resources and their video. Can you walk me through some of like why you built that and what are the things that are in it? Yeah, so I'm in like year 11 as of the time of this recording. And what I realized is in the very beginning of my work, like I told you, I did workshop facilitation and then I did one-to-one coaching. And in my one-to-one coaching in the very beginning, it was very old school. Like I would literally meet with somebody at a coffee shop for an hour and we would go over the work together and we would take notes together. It was very highly customized, very personalized. It was even like, you know, FaceTime, like actual FaceTime. And after having done it for a few years, I started to realize I was repeating myself. (laughs) I was like, this is so interesting. Like everyone's got the same problem. And that's when I started recording the actual trainings because I realized if it's helpful to so many people, it's going to be helpful to so many more people that I'm going to be helping in the future. And so I wanted to give folks a faster way to get to the information than to have me repeat it over and over and over and over again. And I think ultimately, this is how I developed my current system, which is divided up into primarily marketing and communications as one bucket. The next bucket would be focused more on sales and pitching. And then the last bucket is what I would call leadership. So leadership is like visioning, planning, strategy, thinking, things like that. And so most of my trainings, whether I do it in person or whether you go through any of the videos in my library are focused on those particular subjects in one way or or the other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And can you tell me a little bit about what are some important points that you think each of those hold? You know, like with marketing, you kind of talked about having your story. Are there other things that you think are good tips that people should be aware of? In marketing? Well, story is definitely number one. I think so. The other thing that's really important in marketing is brand consistency. And a lot of folks think of their brand as their brand assets. Again, a popular mistake, right? So when I ask folks in a workshop setting, what keywords do you think of when I say brand? A lot of people will say graphics, they'll say logo, they'll say letterhead, they'll say colors, color palettes and font types, right? A lot of these things come up. These are all assets. But to me, the way I define it and the way I encourage everybody who wants to work with me to think about it is brand is how people feel when they think about, hear about, or interact with your practice in any which way, shape, or form. How they feel and literally nothing else. The font types, the colors, the logo, all that supports how an individual feels, but at the end of the day, it's how they feel. So when I talk about brand consistency, I'm talking about like how is a customer's, I'm using that word broadly in the arts, it's also patron, it's donor, it's funder, right? So how do these Mm -hmm. folks feel once they've committed to working with you? That is the brand consistency. And what is their experience like? And are we maintaining that relationship because a lot of times when people get into selling of any kind once they get the money they think the relationship is over they're like "Ooh, got the check okay talk to you later right and so what i like to have people think about is like okay that's the beginning of the relationship is that first transaction you really want to think about brand consistency by maintaining that relationship over a long period so that to me a lot of people don't think about it but that's marketing right? That is marketing to an existing audience who, guess what, if they like your work, if they're satisfied with it, are more likely to evangelize on your behalf. So that would be the next thing I would say is like, don't ever overlook your existing audience. Sometimes people are so hungry to grow an audience. They'll say, I want 20,000 followers. I want 2 million followers. And I always just say, well, math or numbers typically go in a sequence, If you don't take care of the 20 people who love your work, how are you going to get to 200? If you don't take care of your 200 people who love your work, how are you going to get to 2,000? Like, 
we have to do things in sequence. If you have an existing audience, and most of us do in some way or another, even if it's an audience of just two people, take care of those people, right? That's really the beginning of that brand experience. And then from there on, those two people could tell two more people and two more people and 20 people will tell 20 people. You see what I'm saying? So yeah, just to review, three things when it comes to marketing. Have a tight narrative, really be clear about brand and customer experience, and don't overlook the superpower of evangelism from your existing audience. Breaking it down for our audience. Those are some <laughs> gems right there. Okay, so I'm going to ask you the same about sales. So since sales is another thing that you focus on, for sales, what are some advice tips that you would give? So for sales, I would really think about, there are so many things, but off the top of my head, I would really think about what it means to earn somebody's trust. Because somebody will only part with their money willingly, right? Because we're not here to rob and steal from people. <laughs> we want people to willingly part with their money. They'll only do that if they have a really firm sense of trust in you as an individual, as you as a company, or as an organization, as a product, offer, or service, okay? So the thing to think about is in what way are you going to develop that sense of trust and you know, the obviously it begins with that narrative, like what is your story? But there are other elements that you have to include, maybe education, information, further information, a depth of information that folks will need in order to make a buying decision. So, I mean, think about anytime any one of us need to hire somebody like a handyman. I'm just give that as an example. You might come up with like three or four candidates. And what do each one of us do? We look at their website, we look at their review sites to make sure testimonials are good, and we essentially spy on them, <laughs> you know, before we make a buying decision. So we know this as a customer. You should also know this as a producer, as a maker, as a, as a person who's in business. Like, people are going to look at your stuff. So what are you putting out there that can give people a sense of confidence in who you are as an artist? that you're a good person, that you're a good person to work with, that you do good work, that you're going to show up on time, that you're going to complete projects, right? And there's a number of ways you could do that through the information that you share on your website, through review sites, et cetera. Yeah, I love that. I mean, because I feel like it's so easy to get caught in the weeds when you think about sales. Like, it's so easy to get transactional. But by really just stepping back and saying, like, can people trust you? Do they feel like you're going to come through? I mean, that is really like the essence of closing a deal. You know, yes. I think that a lot of times when I'm pitching in person or I'm presenting to somebody, the main thing that I want people to know is that I'm fully capable. And if they take me on as their artist, then I will 100% execute it as I'm explaining it or as I'm, you know, I will walk them through the process so they won't have to worry about anything. They can just enjoy the experience, you know? Yes. Yes. And I think, you know what, I'm going to add something inspired by what you just said, pitching. People need to get comfortable pitching. It's really like a mindset. It's emotional, it's psychological. People have to get comfortable advocating for themselves in a way that makes everybody in the room feel more comfortable, right? And so I think that's an, its own skill all by itself is like, how do you walk people through a presentation, through a pitch, so that we can all get on the same page by the end of that meeting? Yeah. You know, I think my favorite thing that I like to share with people is like when you ask for a large amount of money, you just say the number and you be quiet and you just shut it. You just let the awkward silence happen. You say, I want $5 billion and you just let it just sit because you just have no idea what they're thinking. Like they could be thinking, whoa, that's insane. Who has that type of money? They could be thinking like, is that something that I actually have right now that I can invest in this? Like you have no idea what they're going through. And so even though to you, you could be freaking out like, oh my gosh, this amount is so much, you know, like you almost want to walk it back and say like, well, but you know, I mean, I could do it for 500,000 or, you know, I mean, if you only have 250, then I could work something out. Like I've seen that happen so often. And so I always tell people when they pitch, wait for the awkward silence and just smile through it. Yeah. Because let's point something out that you just highlighted for us. When people walk themselves back, they're basically self-sabotaging. 
they are ruining their own deal because they're getting caught up in their emotions and their fears and their negative visualization. And so what the silence actually does is it gives the potential buyer a chance to think. And when you talk, you're basically ruining their opportunity to take your offer seriously. So give them that space to think. And the best compliment you can get if they don't take the offer is they'll counter. And that's there's nothing wrong with that, right? So that's part of dialogue. So we shouldn't be afraid of anyone's reaction because they're, in my mind, there is no bad reaction unless they just fully walk away. But if they counter you, that's actually a compliment because that's them saying, you know what? I want to work with you, but let's keep talking. And let's keep talking is always a good thing for those kinds of conversations. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think when somebody counters, you're like still in the ballpark. You know, you're I always in. take it as you're in. You're like, they're actually considering this, you know? Yeah. Like, and so whatever they come back with, you're like, you know, because a lot of times too, it's like you go into it knowing that there's a good chance they will counter. So you're like, you, you know, I try and prepare myself for the counter too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Don't counter okay. yourself though. Yeah, no, no, no. That's what I mean. <laughs> just shut it. Just like be quiet. Let the awkward silence happen. Smile big and yeah. feel confident. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Okay. So now the next segment, leadership. What are some of the things that you share with your artists or your entrepreneurs about leadership? Yes. The main thing is all of us, most of us, I'll say most of us were introduced to earning money through wage work. That's the most important thing I want to point out. So as a wage earner, you get paid according to your time, not how smart you are, not how skilled you are. You put in an hour's worth of work, you get an hour's worth of money. Right. So I always like to ask people in a workshop setting, like, what was your first wage job? And people will say like, oh, I used to work at an ice cream shop. I used to work at a restaurant. I used to do retail at a sporting goods store or whatever. And I would say, well, imagine yourself at that age, whatever, 16 years old or whatever it was. And for some reason, you just needed some extra money for the weekend. How would you make that money? And everyone says, well, I just ask for an work extra more shift. Hours. Work more yeah. hours. So that works when you're an employee for a long while it'll work it doesn't work when you are a business owner it doesn't work if you're a creative entrepreneur because you'll run out of time you will run out of time so that's not the mindset that i like people to bring to their entrepreneurial work because they'll burn out is basically what happens and i've seen a lot of people burn out they'll say oh i want to try something i want to try working for myself so they start these small businesses small practices and then they figure, well, I want to be hardworking because that's how I prove myself in the field and that's how I'll make more money. So they do the hard work, but they run out of time because you only have 24 hours. Your body only has so much energy. And so then they quit and they say, well, it wasn't meant to be. And I always think that's a shame because they missed out on this principle that I'm about to share with you now is it's business owner thinking, not employee thinking that you need to bring to your work. That's what I call leadership, right? is like not thinking along a scale of less work is less money, more work is more money, but thinking, how do I do this more intelligently? How do I work smarter? How do I get maximum return for everything that I do put work into? How do I leverage opportunities? How do I leverage my relationships? I don't have everything, but I do have some things. And how do I leverage those resources? So the name of the game is really about leveraging and giving yourself spaciousness to come up with new skill development as needed and strategic thinking and planning, right? Employee thinking does not afford you space to think or to plan because you're just always chasing after the next contract, chasing after the next dollar. And, and why wouldn't you? You are literally rewarded for it with money. So it's easy to get caught up in that hamster wheel, but it's not sustainable. It doesn't move the ball forward. I always tell people, think about how you're going to develop yourself, not just how you're going to make money because money comes and goes. And if you're always chasing after money, eventually you'll just get tired. You will lose that race. So leadership to me is about personal development, professional development, planning, strategy, visioning, like a lot of the stuff that you mentioned at the beginning that I made you do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, absolutely. You know, because 
I think that sometimes when I tell people like, oh, I have a business coach, they take a little step back because, you know, it's like I have an MBA. I'm a business person. I feel like I'm savvy at business. But by having someone like you to work with, it gives me the spaciousness to have that time to think about strategy where because a lot of the times I'm just going, 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 going. It's like a time that I get to set aside and be like, let me pull over and talk about strategy and have somebody to actually feed back and forth with. Because, you know, as an entrepreneur, a lot of times you're doing everything yourself and you don't have somebody that can like bounce ideas back like does this make sense you know just as simple as does this make sense is it clear or this is a strategy I'm trying to go could you help me roadmap this you know yes yeah to me it's about plotting a course and at the end of the day like you know I'm you and I are both in California if we wanted to plot a course in New York that would be like the destination and then we'd have to figure out how are we going to get there through what method, what's most cost effective. And if I'm driving, like what route am I going to take? And, you know, life takes over. So you're going to have to pivot from time to time, but some people only live in pivoting. And that's just crazy to me that they're constantly behind the ball, fighting fires and stressed out. Like you don't have to do it that way. All you have to do, you know, just plot a course, plot a course, and then be prepared to pivot as you go. But at minimum, plot that course. Yeah, I think of it as like sailing. Like they say you have to tack, you know, like depending on the wind, you have to tack in the direction. But you like plot a course and then you tack to stay on course. Exactly. Exactly that. There's another thing that I love that when you shared this with me, and I just want you to share it with our audience. Can you talk about this concept of due dates versus due dates (laughs) and the importance of having them on your calendar? Yes. So everyone knows the due date for their taxes. So that's an example. D-U-E. I almost forgot that one. Because <laughs> <laughs> last year they extended it two months. This year was only one. Almost got me. <laughs> right. So generally speaking, we're looking at mid-April, right? But most people, because, you know, let's say you put that in your calendar because, you're, you know, that's an important date. So you put it in your calendar and you're like, okay, mid-April, got to have taxes turned in. The bad part is people only think about it when it's due, D-U-E. So what I encourage people to do is like, okay, that's when taxes are due, but when are you going to do them? So I tell everyone that they should also think about due dates as in D-O. When are you going to actually do them, execute them, make it happen? And so that date obviously can't be the same as your due date. So you got to push it like weeks backwards and really think about it, you know, for folks who might be listening, who've ever done events, think about it like a a production timeline and you got to reverse engineer that and think about realistically how much time you need going backwards in the calendar to be able to turn it in on time. And again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I'm trying to get people out of that scramble mode where they're always just like, oh my gosh, another thing is due and I got to do that and I got to do that. But they're doing it all against the actual deadline. So I want people to get that spaciousness and start plotting due dates, meaning work hours, when they're actually going to sit down and enjoy doing it far ahead of schedule. Yeah, I think that that's been super helpful because now my calendar, I mean, it looks more insane than it did before because it has the D-U-E dates and D-O dates, but at the same time, it like helps me get things done because I'm like, oh, I don't got time to waste. I already know what's coming next, you know? Yes. Yeah, it's super helpful. Okay, so I have another question that I want you to share with our audience. Websites. As you said, people will go and spy on you and your website. Can you talk me through some things that you've seen in good websites, you know, versus like a bad website? Like what makes a good website? Yeah. So I think we need to be able to answer some of the most basic questions about who you are. That's number one, right? Who you are, whom you serve, how you serve them. And at the end of the day, what should I do as a visitor to take the next step? If someone, and this is true, this was true a while ago, and it's probably faster now, but there was some kind of data that came out some time back that folks spend up to three seconds on a website before determining whether they've landed in the right place or not, which is a bit scary. That's how much time you have to make a first impression to let someone know you're in the right place. You found the right person. That's it. Three seconds. So in those three seconds, I would say you need to be able to answer those questions quickly. You do that through visuals and you do that through language. And you do that all before someone is required to scroll. 
So websites are typically divided into two parts, above the fold and below the fold. <laughs> you know, and that's taken from the old school newspapers that would actually be folded. All the important stories would be above the fold. So on a website, you need to be able to answer those questions for your visitor about whether they've landed in the right place, all above the fold. And then if the answer is yes, I've landed in the right place, then they will be encouraged to continue to stay on your website and scroll and click around, etc. But yeah, at the very top of your website, have that information be as immediate as, as possible. I'm like, I better go update my website. <laughs> like, uh, no. Yeah, we <laughs> live in a... Above the fold or below the fold? It's always changing, you know, because it's like sometimes you update it all the time yeah. and try but to keep it current. I'm like... <laughs> we live in a weird world because people have short attention spans. So we're at a time now where we really have to like honor <laughs> that this is the world we live in. And yeah, let's get people that information as quickly as possible. The more we make people work to get that information, the more likely they are to just leave because people get overwhelmed easily these days. Totally, totally. Okay, so I had, there's this other concept that you walked me through that I, I hadn't thought about in a really long time, and I think it's just such a helpful concept. Can you talk to me about the client funnel? What is the client funnel? Yeah, so... The funnel is a classic business analogy. It's typically, if you think about any funnel, it's wide at the top, narrow at the bottom. So how wide it is at the top basically represents how many people may be interested in your product, your offer, your service, your art, your experience, your event. A lot of people because it's wide. And as people journey through the funnel, meaning downwards to the narrow part, a lot of people will automatically bounce out. But the people who make it to the very bottom of the funnel where it's most narrow, it'll be fewer people, but they're going to be the most interested, most dedicated, most excited about what you're bringing to the table. And so along that funnel, what I like to tell people is if you were to divide it roughly in the middle uh, with a horizontal line, the beginning part of their journey is all marketing and communications and the bottom part of that journey is all sales, messaging, and tactics and meetings, right? So as an example, when folks ask me about social media, I always like to let people know social media is the last layer I would encourage anyone to develop because social media is at the very top of the funnel. It might be a good way to get the word out and let people know you exist but at the top of the funnel where most people might learn about you, they're also the most cold as far as buying temperature. Like, yeah, they know about you, but they're not committed to you. You know what I mean? And so then you might have to start thinking about as they move downward through the funnel, it's going to be through your messaging curation, right? So I'm, I'm speaking really abstractly. Let me see if I could make it more concrete for folks. So let's say I go to your Instagram. I like the art. And then I say to myself, I'd love to learn more about this person. So I go to your link in bio and it happens to be your website. So I go to your website. That's another part of the funnel journey. Okay. I've just taken a step forward, meaning down into the funnel. At your website, I like the art. I continue to like the message. I'm learning about the mission. This is very cool. Oh, wait, check it out. There's a blog. So now I'm going to read the blog. I've just taken another step forward. I'm learning more about this artist. As I'm reading the blog, there's an invitation at the bottom of the blog post that says, uh, join my newsletter so you can find out about my next show. So I joined the newsletter and guess what? I've taken another step into the funnel. So I'm going deeper and deeper into the funnel. And every time I take a step, my excitement, my interest starts to warm up in temperature. And so let's say I do get on the newsletter and I find out about an exhibition. So now I go to that exhibition and I'm like, it would be great to see this art in person. I've taken yet another step. I meet the artist. That artist tells me about one of their pieces. And guess what? It's in my price range. Maybe I'll just buy it. <laughs> so that's an example of like a really simple funnel where every step of the way I was given the opportunity to get more information, to get more excited, to get closer to the work to get closer to the artist until I was, I reached an ability to make a purchase. So that would be like a hyper simplified version. But the thing to point out is that it's a journey and that every step of the journey has to be 
curated for your visitor to be able to walk into your world because we don't know who you are at the top of the funnel. We've just met you. So how can you curate their experience toward getting to know you better? That is, it's safe, it's informative, it's exciting, and then ultimately gives us the opportunity to support you, whether we're a donor, a funder, or just like a straight up buyer. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of things that make me think of when it comes to the funnel. One is that I feel like a lot of people never think about this. You know, like you never really think about the journey that people take to get in touch with your work or get in touch with you as an artist or they follow you for them to get to make a purchase. Like they went through a whole journey before that you might not ever think about. And so I think what also goes hand in hand with the client funnel is like the appropriate messaging that goes with each stage, you know? And I think there's this great analogy where they say like a lot of people message hot messages to a cold audience, you know, so you, or you're doing hot messages, which is like, bye, hey, bye to somebody that doesn't know you. And I guess if there's like this analogy where it's like, it's like, if you walk into a bar and you say, hi, do you want to go home with me? Like right away, <laughs> like, instead of like, hi, what's your name? Would you like a drink? Like you just went in hot, like super hot, you know, like too hot. You just freaked everybody out. And they're like walking away from you because they think you're creepy. Yep. And, and so I think it's something that has stuck with me over the years and thinking about when you think of your client funnel, how do you message to each of those stages? Yeah. Yeah. Super important is exactly that. That's why I use the word curate a lot because the truth of the matter is a lot of people have tools set up. They have already a lot of sort of like marketing and images and stories that they're just haphazardly publishing. And a lot of times when people ask me like whether I can help them with something or not, like again, social media or or blog or what have you, I'm always like, well, how is this going to help your practice? And they're like, well, it's going to grow my audience. I'm like, how exactly? You know, and I'm pushing it when I ask, but it's important for folks to know that they don't have a system, right? So what I encourage folks to do, because most of us do have all these assets, is to start to line them up. At minimum, at least line them up into a sequence because the funnel is a sequential journey. And so far, most people are just publishing things like in shotgun fashion, like, Here's a post and here's another post and here's a picture and here's a story. And, but they're not really thinking about it from a curatorial lens. And so that's what I would encourage folks to think about is like, you know, go back. I mean, for anyone who lived through the 80s and 90s, think about it like a mixtape, right? <laughs> like how would you have the songs line up in a way that there's a clear message, there's a nice journey, right? Don't just play everything at once. It would be noise. <laughs> Yeah. Like you have your intro, you have the one that's like yes. gonna bump away long, you know, like the one that's gonna get you all hyped up. Yeah, it just yep. it goes through a journey. You might have a breakup song in there. It's like it takes you all through all the emotions that you need to go through at that point in time. Yeah. You got an interlude. Yeah. You might have some, you know, people do shout outs or whatever. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? There's all kinds of things that go into it. I want that the art of the hustle mixtape. What are you bringing that out? <laughs> Okay, you got to drop that one. I want Uh, want it. That'll be the next project. (laughs) Okay, so I also want to ask you, you do this amazing thing, and I recently got to experience one, so I just want to big up it, but the 90-day plan, I feel like this has been really transformational for me, and could you share with our audience what is a 90-day plan and, you know, some of the component parts of it? Sure. So the 90-day plan is basically a business plan. And what I like to tell people is there are two kinds of business plans in the world, generally speaking. And the first business plan that most people will be familiar with is you could take a workshop, right? You could take like a six-week workshop and they'll have you do like a market study and they'll ask you about your figures and you'll have to put all these numbers into an Excel spreadsheet. And at the end of the class... They'll tell you to print it out on really nice glossy paper and you should make it look like a a good looking book. And a lot of people will be really proud of this type of business plan. And afterwards, they'll never open it ever again. And that's a shame because you put in all this work into it. So what's the purpose? I'll tell you the purpose. The purpose of those kinds of business plans is to make an impression on someone like a bank or an investor. 
because they want to know that you've thought everything out. That's really the purpose of that business plan. The downside is it's not actually good for execution because life is crazy. Things change very rapidly. And so you can't plot out five years worth of financial projections and how all your customers are going to love you from day one and how you're going to make all this money. Like that's just not realistic. It's nice as a vision. So I don't want to discourage folks from having the vision, but if you want something that you can execute, in my opinion, that would be a 90 day plan is more realistic, right? So a 90 day plan to me is a sprint. Think about what 90 days is. It's basically 12 weeks, which is not a lot of time. So the question that I put forward to anyone who attends my 90 day planning workshop is like, what can you accomplish sprinting through 12 weeks? So it's got to be impactful. It's got to be strategic. It's got to be visionary. It's got to be something you can accomplish, obviously. And so it keeps us hyper focused on a specific set of outcomes. And at the end of the 90 days, what's nice about it is you get to analyze what worked, what didn't work. Again, going back to that leadership thinking, I encourage folks to like actually look at the results. Did you get what you wanted or not? And why or why not? So for the wins, obviously we want to study those so we could replicate them. And for the things that didn't work out, there's still a lesson there. So what is that lesson? What needs to be adjusted? What needs to be figured out? And then you put those learnings into your next 90 day plan and you keep blazing, right? So I feel like it's more realistic, it's more executable. And at the end of the day, if you want to have a plan that's actually going to have impact, it's 90 day plan, not the five year plan, not the 10 year plan. It's the 90 day. Well, I mean, the five year plan, it makes a pretty good, like, hold your door open, you know, it's a good paperweight. <laughs> yes. It exercises your fingers so that you can type really fast. I mean, I've written a few of those. And I, like you said, it's like you get it out. I think what's helpful for me when I have written those, it's a chance for, you know, like a lot of times you don't write it yourself. So it's a chance for your team to get on the same page about like what's a long term trajectory. And then you never look at it again. It's like, like that planning moment is very helpful. We all know where we're going. And then it's like, boom, let's use this to hold the door open. Yeah. But like the 90 day plan, it's like, let me strategize right now what I need to do. That'll just take me to the next level. Because I think a lot of times we get lost in like, we're trying to hit that superstar success, which is so far off that it's like, you know, it's like, what takes you to the next level that takes you to the next level that'll take you to the next level way before you ever get to like the final thing, you know, but that's actually where the growth happens. Yes. And those tinier steps. Yeah. So, okay. So if somebody is like, this sounds awesome, 90 day plan, just like, what are some component parts? Like if somebody wanted to start to do a, like a basic strategy, what would you recommend? So real high level, the component parts would be always revisit who you serve. That's number one, because a lot of times our audiences will change as we mature professionally or even emotionally, right? <laughs> so we have to be really clear about our audience because our audience may shift. And if we don't ask ourselves that simple question, sometimes you might be communicating to the wrong people, right? Or trying to negotiate deals with the wrong people because maybe you've drifted apart, right? So it's always good to ask, is this still my audience? Are these still the folks that I serve? That might be one of the first places. Next is to do some reflection work over the last 90 days. Like, again, like I said, what worked, what didn't work. And then start to think about like, well, what kind of impact would I like to have on my practice if I were to give myself that challenge over the next 90 days? And for that, you might pick a particular subject area. Like you might say, I'm pretty weak in marketing right now and I, I could use that kind of help. So you would use like a big bucket like that and basically start to break that down into smaller projects. And those projects you'd have to put through a screening process, right? And that screening process might have some criteria like, is this going to be impactful? How confident are we that we could actually pull this off? And how easy is this going to be to do? When you say to like, you know, just like zero in on something that you're needing to market for, like if you're poor with marketing, could you give me an example of what that would be? Like just something that's like short term? Yeah. So let's say 
hopefully everyone will be familiar with what a SMART objective is, right? So that's something I commonly talk about. It's an acronym that is specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound, I believe. Yeah. That's a handful to try to remember. So this is my shortcut for everybody. Ask yourself these three questions and you will have a SMART objective. And the three questions are, how much of what by when, right? So going back to the marketing example, let's say we have identified that there's a correlation between number of newsletter subscribers and number of sales. That's just for pretend. That's actually not true for everybody. But let's just pretend that we have determined that there's a correlation and we want to explore it further, right? So we say to ourselves, my goal will be to up newsletter subscribers. So as a coach, I would say, well, how, by how much, right? So right now, you know, let's say you have like a thousand or two thousand or what have you, and you say, well, I'd like to, I think realistically I could get it up to like 30% of that or whatever. So it would be like increase newsletter subscribers by 30% before the end of 90 days. That's the smart objective. Okay. Now that would be the big goal. And you would basically give yourself specific projects to support that goal. So one would be website tweaks. And that could be like a series of actions under that project type. Another could be every time I do a live event, I have a sign-up sheet next to my table. So that's another type of project type. And then there might be another third type that we could invent as we go along. But each one goes back to the main objective, right? And so sometimes people get distracted because they'll say, well, how does my... Again, not to harp on Instagram, but it's so popular. <laughs> so someone might be like, well, what? Are, how do I utilize Instagram to do this? So that's a great question. And my question for that particular individual would be like, can we make it connect or not? And if we can't make it connect, then we have to have the discipline not to focus on that right now. And I'm not saying don't do Instagram. Do it if you think it's fun. But don't do it and think you're participating in your main objective if you're actually not. Right. Right. So that's just an example where we would basically have to have discipline around what to do and what to focus less on if it doesn't circle back to the main objective. Right. Like I, th I think that also circles back to something that we were talking about earlier, where when you had told me, you know, early in my journey with you, where it was like, where I was just trying to like, okay, I need to market more, but I was just focusing on social media. And it was like, well, is that really where you're getting your clients? And I'm like, well, no, actually, I get most of my clients from like, word of mouth going out and pitching or through, you know, reaching out to people directly. And it's like, oh, well, then why would you not focus like that should be where all the focus is on. Yes. It's like, oh, well, of course it is, you know, like, yeah. it, I think it just took pressure off. Because I think, you know, like what we say with social media, it's just so in our face all the time that people feel like you have to always be on it, or you have to always be present on it, where I think it was just a little bit of a relief for myself to think, well, if that's not where I generate most of my income from, then maybe I don't need to focus most of my time on it. Yeah. Well, it's a shiny object and there are lots of shiny objects out there. And that's what I love about the 90 day plan is it basically demotes all the shiny objects. Like, right. and I always tell people, if you want to do this shiny object, just know that that's for personal fun. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. it. But don't ever do the shiny object and think I'm working because maybe you're not, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I think there's also the reverse that's true too, where a lot of people do get clients through social media. If it works for you, it works for you and focus on it. But if it's not what's where you're actually generating, you know, your clients from or your exposure from, then, you know, don't feel the pressure to make that as your main thing. Yeah. You know, something else that you said that I really, I like is just making it measurable because I think a lot of times people say like, I want to increase my, like with this example, I want to increase the people that are in my newsletter that are signing up. You know, I just want to increase it. But without saying specifically like how much you want to increase it, I feel like a lot of times like we get scared to commit, you know, we get scared to be like, oh, I don't want to say too many because then I, what if I don't make it? I'm a failure or, you know, I don't want to say too low because then I'm not really shooting for it. But I think it, just by setting that goal, it like gives you something to measure. So a lot of times I try and force myself, even though I have no idea what is attainable, 
I'll just shoot for something that I think could be a potential and just set a goal. Yeah. I mean, think of it like a road trip, you know, <laughs> like in those, in, you know, when kids ask, like, are we there yet? Imagine being like, well, actually, I don't know where there is because I never, <laughs> I never actually plotted it clearly, you know, and it's the same thing. Like, yeah, set that goal. So you'll know whether you got there or not. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds so simple, but that's very true. Okay. So do you have any last tips that you'd like to share with our audience? We have artists, entrepreneurs at all different levels. Is there anything that you think that maybe could be helpful? Gosh, there's probably a lot of things, but yeah, sure. Here's the one. Here's the one. For every artist I speak with, I always like to encourage them to think of themselves as a micro arts organization, right? And as an organization, you're not just an art maker, because organizations have the responsibility to produce, to promote, to communicate, to host, to educate. Like there's so many things that organizations that we follow where our even our own work may have shown. Sometimes we need to look to those organizations as inspiration. Like they're already doing great work to promote art. And if we follow in their footsteps, at least as a micro organization to promote our own art, then we'll be doing a lot better service for our own work. Thank you. I think that that's an extremely helpful tip. Well, Anthem, thank you so much for being here with us today. I really appreciate your time and just sharing all this expertise and knowledge. Can you tell people where they can find you if they want to reach out to you, if they want to coach, if they just want to find more information out? How do they find you? Yeah. So the best place to find me really is at my website, which is artofhustle.com. And there's an invitation there for folks to download my brochure. If you want to find out more information, that's one good way to find out. And once you're on my newsletter every now and then, I just like, you know, check in, share what's happening in my life, share announcements, share workshop opportunities and coaching opportunities. For folks who are serious about trying to look for a coach, if you are stoked about that possibility, then so am I. And I often offer folks 20-minute uh, complimentary consultations where we could talk very briefly about your practice and see if I might be a, a good fit for what you're trying to accomplish. And so you're welcome to do that as well through the contact form at my website. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anthem, for being here with us today on the Not Real Art Podcast. We super appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. And thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Definitely. Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. Please be sure to like this episode, write a review, and share with your friends on social. And if you haven't already done so, please press the subscribe button and follow us on Instagram at Not Real Art World.